Still going. Still trying to record. Well, welcome everyone to uh, Bible class for Palm Sunday, uh, April 5th. Uh, 2020, as we're gathered, uh, sequestered in our homes and gathered together. Uh, this morning, we're going to be walking through John chapter 12, at least uh, about half of the chapter this morning. Uh, this is uh, the material between um, the raising of Lazarus that uh, we looked at last week in, in John chapter 11 and, and moves into eventually midway through this chapter into uh, Jesus' triumphal entry on Palm Sunday into Jerusalem. So uh, let's go ahead and begin uh, with Lord. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the, the blessings that you give to us. Uh, Lord, the blessings of technology that we're thankful for this day as uh, we are uh, separated from one another by distance, and uh, but at the same time we get to gather together around your word, your word which uh, helps us to grow, which connects us, which faith. So we just ask that you'd send your spirit among us and with us to strengthen our faith this day through the study of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, everybody, we're uh, going into John chapter 12. We are recording this for folks uh, to be able to watch later if they aren't able to pick it up live today. So again, we're glad that you're with us. Uh, just uh, as we look at John chapter 12, um, again, the context of this, uh, right before John chapter 12, you have uh, the death of Lazarus, Lazarus, one of Jesus' friends, uh, and then um, Jesus... Uh, Arrives late, he dies, he heals him, and then the Jews have this plot to want to kill Jesus. Uh, and then chapter 12 picks up with Jesus still in Bethany, uh, still uh, not too far from Jerusalem, only about two miles. Uh, uh, Bethany is a um, suburb or a bedroom community or uh, an outer ring a distance. I'm getting your walking, so two miles is, is more like, like a minute walk through the the hills over the Mount of Olives down through the Kidron Valley and then into Jerusalem I'll just show you a couple pictures of the Mount of Olives um, um, and uh, looking at a couple different uh, ways here just to give us the, the context um, something cycle back actually so this is uh, the Mount of Olives uh, looking towards the east uh, if you follow this that, that highway back, um, you can see the, the road, the highway down here. If you follow that back all the way around, it goes down to Jericho. Um, Bethany would have been nestled somewhere probably over here in the hills. Uh, directly behind me as I'm taking this picture uh, is uh, would be the city of Jerusalem. So that's, uh, that's the Mount of Olives looking to the east. Uh, we were in here at the end of the rainy season. This is the greenest that the Judean wilderness gets. Um, I have another picture somewhere of the same shot, but uh, everything is brown and dry because it's uh, the dry season. So um, this is the road that leads towards Bethany off to the east. Uh, I can see I'm on the Mount of Olives if you look over there. Um, and then um, if I turned around, this is the road then that leads towards Jerusalem. So this is the road. Uh, that Jesus would have traveled on as he entered in, in on Palm Sunday. So we'll look at a few more of those pictures here in a little bit. All right. So uh, can somebody read for us um, John chapter 12, if anybody is willing to read John chapter 12, uh, verses 1 through 8 um, would be great. I can do that. your microphone. Thanks, Six Jim. days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany. <clears throat> where Lazarus was. Am I okay? Okay. Yeah, go ahead, Richard. Keep going. Okay. Whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at the table. Mary, therefore, took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, in parentheses, he who was about to betray him, end of parentheses, said, Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? 
He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief and having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put in it. Jesus said, leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you will always have with you, but you do not always have me. All right, thank you very much, Richard. So in case you were wondering how uh, John feels about Judas, right? He's the one who's about to betray him and he's a thief. So uh, John just lays it all out there, doesn't just against Judas here. Uh, again, John would have been one that uh, walked around with Judas for three years, um, would have had uh, been like a brother with him as they worked and lived and traveled with Jesus. Um, and so that betrayal of Jesus uh, was also probably a betrayal of John uh, in the midst of that there. So um, it's only in John's gospel that we hear that the, the woman who anoints Jesus feet that breaks this expensive jar of perfume and and wipes them with her hair and tears. Only in John's gospel do we hear that that is Mary, uh, Lazarus's sister. Um, in the other gospels, we don't uh, really learn her name or her much about her identity. Uh, but uh, here where they're at, um, they're in Bethany. Um, you know, they're given a dinner for Jesus. Martha served, right? Uh, verse uh, two, that's her character. She's serving still. Um, but Lazarus, uh, was with them at the table. And so it's six days before the Passover. It's the, um, it's that week before they're given a feast. Um, so yeah, probably, um, might be the, yeah. So they're, they're working on that. They're going together. It's that, uh, Saturday evening, probably after the sun has set that they're doing this in the midst of that, as we're looking at six days before, um, there. So, um, uh, Judas gets upset, um, and Jesus says that what she's doing is a good thing because she's anointing me for my burial, right? Jesus knows who, what's going to happen, um, who talks about how this uh, is admitting, uh, is saying that she's preparing her for the burial. Um, and then that statement of Jesus, it's uh, you know not disregard for the poor. You always have the poor with you. You won't always have me. So it's not a not a matter of uh, saying that Jesus uh, doesn't care about the poor, but saying that what she is doing is right and good and proper uh, because of what is coming there. Any questions on this episode of uh, this first start? Uh, we're in John chapter 12 again. We just read verses one through eight of John chapter 12. Uh, any thoughts, any questions, comments about this first section here? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, uh, Pastor Schultz. It's not really a question, and I don't know if you'll have a comment about this or not. I just, I just think it's kind of interesting how, um, how this whole like section is just kind of bookend with talk about resurrection and life after death. I mean, you know, we've just been in a in a chapter, chapter eleven, that's all about Lazarus and Jesus raising him from the dead, but already again in in verse one of chapter twelve. John mentions that this is Lazarus. He's there. He's the one Jesus raised from the dead. And then at, by the end of this, it's all about Jesus saying, hey, and, and I'm going to rise, y yeah. you know, um, or at least I see that. Maybe I guess it doesn't explicitly say that it's it's the burial. Maybe I'm jumping but, ahead of myself. But. but it's death and resurrection and tomb language. Yeah, I think you're you're right. It, it, it's almost uh, there's you know, raising from the dead, there's the uh, opposition against Jesus. Then there's the, again, talk about raising from the dead and what Jesus has done. And then you get more opposition. And then you, so it's going back and forth. Uh, John is doing this uh, even more than bookends, I think. Uh, he's interweaving uh, what Jesus is doing, that he is the master over life and death with those that are trying to oppose him. Uh, this is interwoven together and each section of John here. Um, and that's not uh, an accident um, to heighten, again, what Jesus is doing with raising the dead and, you know, this act of generosity that Mary does. Again, 300 denarii is about a year's wages, um, but it's an act for the burial. Um, back and forth and back and forth, um, raising the heightened, uh, uh, the heightened, heightening the difference between 
those who seek to kill Jesus and why um, with what who Jesus actually is, the one who has master over life and death. Yeah, and, and John uh, John continues to weave his, his asides in there. Um, you know, the idea of like, oh, oh, yeah, this is the guy who did this. Oh, it was about a year 300, you know, you know, or this is uh, Judas, he's the, he's a thief and, you know, all that kind of stuff in there too. Um, and even stuff about, um, you know, Bethany, where Lazarus is from, who he raised from the dead, all of these asides that John brings in. Yeah, you had a question, mom or dad? Yes. In verse eight or seven and eight, it's interesting. It's always been interesting to me that Jesus gives uh, more than approval, uh, an encouragement of what Martha's doing, or Mary's doing, as opposed to helping the poor. I think sometimes we want to rank things like that and make it look more important to help the poor, use this money to help the poor. But Jesus says, no, this is good. Um, just questioning, you know, about that. Yeah. And so I, that was a, you know, a, a special unique time, I think, too, in the midst of this, as we think about that, um, you will not always have me, right? We, we can't do this kind of act towards Jesus right now. Um, and so um, Jesus said, you know, for, but for Mary, this was the appropriate act to give to her Lord and her God to prepare for his burial um, as a special instance in time. Um, so in the future, um, that money could be sold, that could be sold and given to the poor because Jesus wasn't there anymore uh, in, in that same way um, for her. So um, she was doing the right thing at the right time. And I think it's important as we think about that and maybe apply that to today of what's the right thing at the right time. Sometimes the right thing at the right time is to take care of the poor. Sometimes the right thing at the right time are to is to take care of our family or to take care of someone in our family who has died. Uh, what's the right thing at the right time? I, I think that's a, an important thing to think about and to, to weigh. Um, and so it's not always, um, yeah, thanks, Pastor Schultz. Uh, help them any, you know, thanks for that comment there. Yeah, but the, the idea is the right thing at the right time. Um, you know, they had, People in this, in Jesus' day and age, we hear from the Gospels had said, well, whatever you would have done to take care of your parents, uh, if you give it to uh, the church, then then it's okay. If you give, put it in the coffers, then you don't have to take care of your parents. Well, we have that obligation to take care of our families uh, and that are there as well as to take care of the poor and to take care of our church um, in, in the midst of all of those things. Um, yeah, love was her motivation. Uh, being the right thing at the right time. Judas had his motivation as something completely different. Uh, his was, as John points out, it was greed. Um, and it was, uh, you know, false piety on Judas's part that was there. All right, any other thoughts or questions? You know, that was kind of meaningless being the son of God. If he wanted to, he probably could have instantly replaced it with a many gallons of the most wonderful, expensive perfume ever known, yeah. you know, as far as regarding the value of the perfume. Yeah. And so, so to God, you know, as God looks at our gifts, Richard, I think there's a, right. He's God. What does he need with expensive versus inexpensive? Right. But for us, when we give a gift, the, the extravagance of the gift it, it shows our heart and our faith in the midst of that. And so when we give an extravagant gift, um, what pleases God is not how much the price tag was, but what's pleasing to God in the midst of that it is how much that gift means to us and what we're willing to sacrifice for him. Uh, that's how we, you know, we look at that. Um, you know, you can, you can think of it. There's a, I don't remember which book Pastor Schultz probably went off the top of his head book that tells a story about a man who bought his wife a wedding ring. And, you know, this man was uh, wealthy, uh, had a, a high powered paying job, um, but, you know, wasn't super into the physical and into the, um, you know, the, the material things. 
And so he bought his wife a simple wedding ring. Well, that wasn't a sacrifice for him to do that. And so his wife was kind of, fiance was kind of frustrated at the lack of extravagance that she spent, he spent on that because he had the means to do that. Where somebody of lesser means that same ring meant so much more to the person that received it um, because of what they could afford and the extravagance per person. And so um, yeah, I can't remember. It's a, uh, it might be divine applause. I can't remember for sure on that one, Pastor Schultz, but uh, um, I, I can't remember for sure on that. Um, and they tell, he tells the story much better in that book, but that, that's the idea of the, the extravagance um, to God. When we give out of the heart, when we give first, when we give uh, above or beyond or um, as a sacrifice, that's how it's pleasing to God, not what the exact amount of it is. And so for Martha to give a year's wages was extravagant. You know, if, if somebody uh, with the wealth of like a King Herod would have given the same gift, uh, that wouldn't have been extravagant. Uh, and so it's, again, it shows the heart of the giver, um, what that reflects, not necessarily, the amount doesn't reflect the importance, it reflects the heart of the giver. So. Any other thoughts or comments? Thanks for that, Richard. All right, let's continue on. I think Jim was willing to read before. Jim, are you willing to read the next section? If so, we'll have you read uh, John 12, verses 9 through 11. Uh, Jim, uh, Jim Mueller. Okay. When the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death as well, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. All right. So again, you get this back and forth. There's the Lazarus and the resurrection and the raising of the dead. And now you have the plot to kill Jesus at the end of 11. And now you go back to Jesus and Lazarus for Jesus' death and eventual resurrection. And because he's not in the tomb long enough to, to have the anointings done. And then you go back to this plot uh, by plotting uh, by the Pharisees and the religious leaders, the chief priests that are movement uh, back and forth uh, within uh, John's gospel. Um, you know, all this is going on in Bethany. Um, so, you know, there's not, you know, as this moves back and forth. Uh, and so you think about that, um, the crowds, uh, they're coming out to see Lazarus. Um, the Jews are coming from Jerusalem and all of the surrounding towns and villages. They're coming to see Lazarus, not just Jesus who raised Lazarus, but also Lazarus. And, and you can almost you imagine that he's, he's a novelty, right? We think about uh, what uh, he's experienced um, in the midst of all of that. Um, why, you know, why they're, uh, you know, Lazarus, what, what's it like when you die? Lazarus, what happens when you die? What, what do you see? Lazarus, um, you know, um, what can I expect? What's it feel like? What's heaven like? He's an instant celebrity because it's not every day that you see a, a dead man walking around and, and that can answer those kinds of things for us. Uh, and help us with, you know, those things of death. Um, um, yeah, so the, in the midst of that. So, so you want to comment on that, Justin? Turn my mic on. Yeah, um, I guess that you compare the two and how Jesus is so clear to the young girl's family to not tell anyone and, um then you have obviously Lazarus being kind of the complete opposite where there are drowning. So I guess if anyone has any thoughts on that, definitely throw that out. But I've always kind of wondered if that was partly, and obviously we're trying to read into the mind of Jesus, which we really don't want to do, but, <laughs> but I've always wondered if that might have a little bit of the same reasoning behind it. Plus Lazarus is a walking, talking representation of who Jesus is. So, which isn't what the Jews want. Yeah, and, and I think there's probably, uh, my guess is there's a sense probably of both of, you know, in some of the other miracles and the, the raising of Jairus's daughter, um, you know, 
I think there's a little bit uh, of that, of not wanting to draw the attention to uh, or her family and get that, that negative press, if you will, or, or opposition. Uh, you see what happens with the man born blind when the fair, you know, like when he's found out to be healed by Jesus. But there's also, I think, uh, probably maybe a bigger part of this is um, Jesus wants to be known for who he is, not just some uh, traveling guy who does tricks and miracles. And um, But he wants to make sure the word isn't and the message and the kingdom of God in the midst of that isn't lost. Uh, and also along with that, that the opposition doesn't build against him too quickly. Um, and so he removes himself from certain places and he tells people not to speak about it um, until the time is right. Uh, and now the time has come. The time is fulfilled. The time is right. And there is no secret and there is no hiding this. Um, Jesus is the life bringer. Um, and, and so uh, people are going out to see Jesus. They're showing out to give the one who embodies that life. And, and Lazarus, uh, not just dead for a few hours, um, but dead for days, um, now uh, brought back to life uh, in the midst of that. So um, that's why Lazarus really becomes the focal point, um, both for those followers of Jesus uh, he represents, he embodies this, but also now for the opposition against Jesus. Uh, and so he gets a target on his back. Uh, he's the the symbol, the rallying cry of, see, here's Jesus. He does raise the dead. Look at Lazarus. Uh, that paints a, par a target on his back. And so the chief priests not only have this kind of warrant out to kill and arrest Jesus, but also now to kill Lazarus too. Because uh, the, the thinking probably is if the guy who was miraculously raised is instantly dead again, well, maybe then it's not such a big deal. Um, yeah, in the midst of that. Any uh, thoughts, questions, comments uh, for us at this point? Questions, thoughts on that uh, section here. This, the, those uh, three verses, but a lot packed in there. Um, there's jealousy going on by the Jews. Um, there's motivation to protect it and save their nation, um, but there's a, a little bit of all of that in their motivations. All right. Seeing no questions or comments. Again, if you want to use the chat, if you want to just uh, unmute yourself and pop in, if you're on a phone, a star six to unmute and pop in. Or, or if you uh, are able to use the chat feature, want to put a question, a comment, or just put a question mark or an exclamation point, over there, you're welcome to do that too, or unmute yourself and jump in is fine as well. All right, let's keep going on this. Uh, we're gonna um, now go into the triumphal entry of Jesus. Um, and before we go on to that, I wanna show you a few pictures, uh, do that again, uh, of what this looks like today. Well, I say today, what I really mean is what this looked like a year ago, almost to the day we were in uh, Israel a year ago at this time, the group of us from uh, St. John's, um, and we've been sharing some emails around with that group that went, uh, how thankful we are that we were able to go last year um, and not uh, not necessarily to this year because we probably wouldn't have been able to go or go to see anything. So again, uh, this is from the Mount of Olives. Um, this is from the Mount of Olives looking towards the west uh, this gold um, dome right in the middle of the picture is um, that is the um, the the, um, the 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 dome of the rock. Excuse me, I was drawing a blank for a second. That's the dome of the rock. It's a Muslim uh, holy shrine uh, built on the site of where the temple was in Jesus' day. Um, so the Jesus the the temple of Jesus' day. Um, if you picture it here, how tall this dome is, um, the temple in Jesus' day would have been just as tall, um, but would have been as wide as you see this base is. That's how tall the whole temple would have been. So it was a, an, an ancient marvel. You could see it for miles around. Um, this wall would have been similar to what it would have been in Jesus' day. Uh, Jesus is making for these gates uh, right down here. And so we'll, we'll kind of this is a, a I'll, uh, I take some pictures along the road here as we're traveling. Here's the dome again. Uh, today it's a, a cemetery. Um, 
that uh, a Jewish cemetery, they believe the Messiah is coming back. And so they want to be present when the Messiah comes, is going to come in the Mount of Olives. And so they have that as hope of resurrection there, even the Jews, um, you know, in the midst of that. Um, so we're walking down now the, the Mount of Olives, uh, getting closer towards uh, down the, the valley, the switchbacks, the trails back and forth, uh, down into the valley. Again, that gold dome was where the temple would be. Uh, back and forth down uh, the winding road here. Um, as it is today, it would have probably been a winding road of Jesus' day, but maybe a little bit different path. Um, down into the Kidron Valley um, in the midst of there. So um, you can see even some palm leaves and things. You can imagine people flocking to Jesus here uh, in the midst of that valley. So uh, there's some pictures there that uh, maybe give you a sense of tight streets and paths, palm branches waving, people throwing um, coats on their on the ground uh, for Jesus to have the red carpet, the royal carpet treatment in there. So can somebody with that context in mind read for us verses 12 through 19? Sure. Thanks, Patty. The next day, the great crowd had come, a great crowd had come from for the festival heard, let me try this again. The next day, <laughs> the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to him shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Jesus found a young, a young donkey and sat on it as it is written, do not be afraid daughter Zion, See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. I'm sorry, how far? 16? Uh, through, I'm sorry, um, through, uh, through 19, Patty. I'm, 19. Yeah, thank you. At first, his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had performed this sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, see, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the world has gone after him. All right, thank you. All right, so I, I, just another picture. This is from the bottom of the Kidron Valley now looking up. Uh, at the eastern gate, uh, you can't see the Dome of the Rock, but it would have been up over here uh, in, in Jesus' day. Um, some of the pictures and even some of the, the palm branches that are there uh, from the middle of the Kidron Valley. Okay, so um, all right. So as, as we look at that, the um, we have some of these Old Testament references uh, question about the Eastern Gate closed up. So, uh, yeah, just the historically, um, the the Muslims control the Temple Mount, um, and they have now for um, for years, for centuries. Um, and so, let me get back to that picture there quick. Um, they have now for centuries, um, and so they've actually closed up the Temple Mount for a theological reason um, to stick it to both the Christians and to the Jews. Um, so this, this is the Eastern Gate. Um, it said in rabbinic writing that the, um, the Messiah, the King, would enter into Jerusalem through the Eastern Gates uh, in the Jewish writings. And so what did the Muslims do? They've walled up the Eastern Gate. So, and they've put uh, up here are all Muslim graves and to desecrate the place. And so for the their Messiah, the Jewish Messiah, to enter into the Temple Mount, he'd have to get through a walled gate and through dead bodies, which would make him desecrated and unclean. Um, now, it also is trying to stick uh, the thumb at uh, Jesus and the Christians um, because they believe, uh, many Christians believe that Jesus will physically return through the Eastern Gate uh, on the last day, in the same way you saw him go, he's going to come back to the Mount of Olives and those kinds of things. Uh, again, Jesus has already fulfilled the prophecy of coming into Jerusalem. So 
uh, he doesn't need to go through the Eastern Gate. But uh, as as I think Patty has said, if that's where he has to go through to fulfill that, uh, bricks and, and all that kind of stuff, dead bodies, none of that's going to stop Jesus. Um, as Christians, we don't think it needs to be there. Uh, as, as Lutheran Christians, it doesn't have to be through the Eastern Gate. Um, but that's why the Muslims did that, um, to wall that up, to restrict access to it, uh, to make that a way you can't go in, but also to, uh, from a theological point of view, uh, to try to, to stop the Jewish or the Christian way from uh, uh, second coming or Messiah from coming through. So, yeah, just a, kind of an interesting, just all of the cultural and political things that wrap around um, Jerusalem. Um, in the thoughts and what people think they're doing because of that. So, yeah. Um, so the crowd shout, Hosanna, blessed is the, is, is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And, and so this is what the crowds are shouting. Uh, they're shouting Hosanna. They're shouting, uh, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, uh, even the King of Israel. And that's really um, a quote um, from Psalm 118. So I'd invite you guys to flip uh, in your Bibles to Psalm 118. We're going to uh, jump back there and see uh, this Psalm. Psalm 118. So right before the longest chapter in the Bible in Psalm 119. Uh, but Psalm 118. Um, and we're not going to read the whole psalm right now, but this is the psalm that starts, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say it, steadfast love endures forever. Let Aaron say his steadfast love endures forever. See, you can imagine this call and repeat probably going on and shouting uh, through this psalm. But then you get all the way down to, we're going to look at verses 25 and 26 uh, of Psalm 118. Would somebody read for us those two verses, Psalm uh, 118, verses 25 and 26? Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. All right, and so you get this, uh, save us in Hebrew is uh, save us now or save now or sa is, is Hosanna. Um, so... Hosanna, we pray, O Lord. Save us now, O Lord. Give us success. Blessed is you comes in the name of the Lord. Or they're quoting from this psalm, and, and so they're probably singing all of this song and shouting all of this song, but they're not just directing it to the Lord. They're really directing it to Jesus, uh, who is you know even the King of Israel, the one whose steadfast love endures forever, the one who will be the um, you know, If you look back in verse 22, um, of that psalm. The stone the builders rejected has become the, the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Um, entering the gates. Oh, yeah. Thanks, Ron, for that. Uh, of, of all of that, um, you know, just this psalm is uh, directed at now Jesus as, uh, as we see um, just they're them singing this psalm. Um, they are recognizing him as the Messiah. They're saying this one coming, he is the Messiah. He is the King of Israel. There's no doubt about what um, the crowd is believing and thinking Jesus to be. He is the fulfillment of this psalm. Um, and the psalm in, in the Old Test the, the, uh, these readings in the Old Testament that the Messiah is coming. Again, the Messiah is coming through the Eastern Gate to restore and remake and renew all things. Uh, and so that's what they are believing is coming and to be placed. That's who Jesus is, the King of Israel. All right. Let's also go then and look at Zechariah 9. Um, Zechariah 9, especially verse 9. Um, Zechariah 9, 9. This is the what's written. Um, and so oftentimes when the New Testament writers are, are quoting, um, they aren't saying, well, this is from Zechariah 9, verse 9. They aren't saying that for a couple of reasons. One, um, the ver chapter and verse numbers haven't been invented yet. 
Um, that was a much later um, um, tool that the scribes and Masoretes and others put into scripture to help us better study and keep track of it. Uh, the second reason is um, most of the folks that were, you know, reading or, or studying these things would have had large sections, especially, you know, the Jews, large sections of the Old Testament memorized. And so they didn't have to quote the whole thing. They would start saying a verse of it, and they would knew, know that you were referring back to that whole section, which, as a good Jewish man or woman, you had memorized. And so both um, as the crowd is crying, they know this psalm. And now as John is retelling it for his hearers, um, he is referring them back to Zechariah 9.9. 9. They know exactly that it's going to be from Zechariah. Um, and then they know what the surrounding context in verse is. And so oftentimes when things are quoted uh, in the New Testament, um, they're not just referring to those one verse, but really the, the section of scripture, and maybe even the whole context around it. So um, would somebody read for us, and this is our Old Testament reading actually for today, if you were uh, uh, have already worshipped online, if you haven't, then this is a spoiler for the Old Testament. Um, can somebody read for us verses, uh, just uh, verse 9 and 10 of Zechariah 9? Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, a foal of a donkey. And read one more verse, Richard. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. All right. Thank you very much. All right. So you look at this prophecy, yet only the one is recorded there. But what this prophecy is, is saying is um, the king is coming, humble, mounted on a donkey, and the colt, the foal of a donkey, cut off the chariot from me from the wharf from Jerusalem. Basically, no more will war or armies threaten you, Jerusalem. They've been cut off. They can't get to you. You have peace, shalom now, forever, and he's going to rule the, the nations and the world uh, forever. This is the king that's coming. And so in John's gospel, what's interesting is the crowds are shouting, Hosanna. The crowds have cut down palm branches, which is what you did for a, a coming in hero, uh, someone who would liberate you. You would cut them off and wave them and join and go be part of the celebration. Uh, they're shouting, Lord, save us. They're invoking that Jesus is the Messiah. And then what? And then in John's gospel, and, and this is different than in the other gospels, it's then that Jesus acts, and Jesus then sits on the donkey, uh, affirming what the crowd is saying, that he is the Messiah. Jesus, as he rides in, says, yes, I am the guy that uh, was written about. I am the guy that was coming. I am the king of Israel. I am the promised Messiah. I am the one who will bring peace. Jesus, by sitting on the donkey, is communicating that uh, to uh, the crowds that day, and he's communicating that to us who are the hearers of John's gospel and the readers, that Jesus is the Messiah, the promised one who is coming. Uh, just going to stop there for questions, comments, or, or thoughts before we kind of go and unpack the rest of this. So the, the question is, are the crowds the same crowds? Um, it, it's, it's really hard to know. Part of the crowd that John is clear that's coming with Jesus on Palm Sunday is this crowd that's coming from Bethany um, that um, has been with Jesus, has seen his miracles, uh, seems to believe and follow him. They are also joined from Jerusalem to them. And so... Um, I would say it's possible that there are some in the same crowds, but it's also very probable and possible that it's not a one-for-one -one person, um, and at least maybe the core element of the crowds are, are different. Uh, here, the, the core element of the crowds are ones that are um, believers coming with Jesus from, Lazar, from Bethany, 
the core of the crowds, uh, probably on Good Friday, um, are probably more of those that are in line with the chief priests and the Pharisees. Now, some of the periphery folks and some of the people that make the mob in both, some of those may very well be the same. Um, but I'd, I'd think your core people, the ones that are the instigators, I, I in my mind, those are probably different folks. Pastor Schultz, you want to have thoughts on that? You want to weigh in on, on your take on that too? Oh, I, I would not disagree with you. I think I think you're exactly right. I think there's also a thing that, you know, there's a periphery element that's, I think you were kind of saying that's easily swayed, right? Yeah. Caught up in the moment for good or for bad. I think you use the word mob. I think that's that's a pretty appropriate, I mean, who doesn't like a party? Hey, what's yeah. going on here? You know, yeah. for good or for bad, there's probably some of that, but yeah, I think you're right about a, a larger core of committed or or uh, or those that despise him too. That probably doesn't switch so easily. Yeah, yeah. great. Thank you. Uh, any other thoughts or questions on on this section at this point? Uh, when we talk about people, we're talking about uh, tens of thousands of just pilgrims um, that are coming into Jerusalem. Um, you know, the numbers. You know. You know, anywhere from twenty to thirty to even a hundred thousand people that might come for the pilgrimage at Passover uh, at Jesus' day, and so you're talking a large number of people and the people in and out. So those crowds can be different. Um, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, thanks for that, Amanda. Jeremy, go ahead. Yeah, I'm just wondering seriously. Do do you have a thought, Pastor Andy, as to why John's gospel is different? That's so interesting. That what you what you point out about John, um, John showing Jesus to do that in response, like him affirming that. I, I just, I'm curious what, why, why John's different like that. John's different all over the place. <laughs> I mean, my first, I mean, he's, there's a reason. Um, so if we call, uh, when we study the gospels, we call Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Those three, we call the synoptic gospel because they're similar. Uh, they have the, a, a similar outline and structure, a similar chronology, even, uh, John uh, tends to, their, um, Matthew, Mark, and Luke would be more similar to what we would call and are used to in uh, biographies or autobiographies. Um, John's gospel doesn't necessarily use time to organize his thoughts. He, he writes more according to themes, uh, more according to um, trying to prove a theological point in the midst of those things. So for John, I think he's highlighting this action of Jesus of getting on the donkey where in the other gospels, Jesus getting on the donkey is his idea in every single gospel, but only in John's does he do it in response. Um, and I think it's to highlight um, this idea of the crowds are completely right in claiming he's the Messiah. And so Jesus also is making that same claim. He's highlighting that claim of Jesus by when he frames Jesus getting on the donkey. That, that's how I read that and didn't see that. <laughs> so who had to climb the palm trees to get the branches? Um, so I showed you that picture of, uh, picture that of, of the palm tree here, Nathan, of like, you can see it, uh, these palm trees. So um, they, you know, what's interesting is if you've, um, I lived in Florida for a little bit and um, teenagers ha have a knack for climbing these trees. Um, that's what kids are for. Exactly. Right. Amanda, they know how to do this, but it's also, uh, it's not in this picture, the shrubbery, the, the vegetation has changed, but some of these palms would have just been laying, you know, um, not the, the big tall palm trees, but some more, just more like ferns and different things they could have grabbed and uh, from bushes and different things too. So uh, even if you were uh, afraid of heights and didn't have a kid to go climb that for you, you still could have gotten a palm that way. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Um, John is also, yeah, Amanda, that's a, a great point. Uh, John is usually believed to be the, or uh, I guess that's uh, um, Justin there, uh, usually believe the last gospel that's written as well. Um, yeah, exactly right. Um, and so one of the reasons why John can be different in his gospel um, is because um, if, as he's the last gospel written, maybe even by a decade or more, um, the other gospels have probably been circulated through the churches. 
And so John knows that uh, most of his audience probably knows the narrative. And so he's writing his gospel for, again, different uh, focus and different things to, to point out to people and highlight for people who Jesus is in a different way. All right. Any other thoughts or questions? All right, so let me get into this interesting thing where uh, John, uh, as, as I think Justin pointed out earlier, these asides from John, he um, he gets another one of these. His disciples didn't understand these things at first, but even when he was glorified, they also remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him, right? You get this interesting idea, This the, the disciples are just as clueless as the crowds, right? They know he's the Messiah, but he's not the Messiah that they think think they're going to get, the one that's going to liberate them from Rome and all of their oppressors. Um, you know, if you think about it, uh, Israel's been oppressed going back to Babylon, and then it was Persia, and that was the time of Ezra that we were talking about. And then from from there, they it was the, the Greeks that came and took over from them. And, and then the Maccabees had this little mini revolt, and many people thought he'd be the Messiah, but that didn't last too long as their dynasty became corrupt and gave way to Rome. Uh, and so they're looking for this lasting peace, this peace that will end um, politically. And so, um, yeah, then, so the disciples are right with the crowds. And so John's careful to point out to us of, hey, we didn't get it at first either, um, but only after he was glorified. And so, uh, Patty, you asked the question about, is that referring to his resurrection? Um, in part, um, but in John's gospel, Jesus is shown in all of his glory and his majesty, not only in the empty tomb, but first and foremost on the cross. As Jesus suffers and dies, that is where his glory, his majesty is shown and revealed, where it turns things on its head. Um, not, you know, the cross doesn't seem like glory. We see the resurrection where he conquers death and all of those things. But in John's gospel, it's really the cross. Uh, that's when he is glorified on the cross um, as he fulfills his father's plan, as he is the perfect Passover lamb of God. Um, that's how Jesus is glorified um, and his glory is revealed. Um, and um, yeah, when I'm lifted up, I'll draw him into myself um, in the midst of that too. That's also true, Pastor Schultz, right? Uh, Jack and John chapter three, when he, when he talks about uh, in the midst of there as well, that he, um, so the man lifted up so much, I be lifted up, right? That's the uh, pointing all the way through there uh, as he is glorified in that way. Yeah. Any other thoughts or questions or comments? Yeah, glory in the cross. Um, the, the theology of glory says, no, glory can't happen through anything bad. It only happens through what we think is good. Uh, but God has the theology of the cross where he demonstrates his glory uh, in the suffering and the death of Jesus. Yeah. All right. All right. So in the midst of this, you have the crowds interacting. You have the crowd that came from Lazarus and his tomb. They're talking about, they're bearing witness that Lazarus did rise from the dead, that he is, uh, um, that Jesus has the power over death and the devil, that he is the king, that he is the Messiah, the one they've been waiting for. And now, um, um, and so John says, the reason the crowds had, had, uh, gone out to meet him was that they had heard that he had done this sign. And so, uh, Jim, you were talking about earlier, just, uh, the question about, is this, um, is this the same crowd or not? And so you've got the crowd coming from Bethany, but then the crowd that comes out to meet him, this is maybe, uh, some of this group might be the more fickle crowd. They're coming, they're joining because they've heard he's a miracle worker and he can do great signs. And so that's why they're coming out in the midst of that. And the Pharisees say, look, you gain nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. Um, again, that's an interesting theological point, I think, that John's making, that Jesus isn't just the Messiah for the Jews. 
that, that John is pointing to us that, hey, look, the world has gone after him. Jesus is the Messiah for all people, for the cosmos, for, for you and for me, for the world uh, in the midst of this. So um, that leads into the, the last section that we're going to do today. Um, John chapter 12, verses 20 through 26. Can somebody read that for us? John chapter 12, uh, 20 to 26. Go ahead, John. Now among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies and it bears, bears much fruit, whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me, and where I am, there will, there will my servants be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. All right, thanks, Joe. And so here we get a little more uh, uh, cued in or, or clued in, I should say, as to what Jesus is, again, is talking about, about being glorified. Um, it now has to, the hour come to be glorified, right? A grain of wheat must die. Um, uh, whoever loves his, lo loves his life will lose it, and whoever hates his life for this world will keep it for eternal life. Anyone who serves me must follow me. Where I, you know. So he's talking about this. Um, to be glorified for Jesus means that he's actually going to die, uh, not die a purposeless death, and not die a death that the um, that the is caused by or instigated by the chief priest, but a, a death that he willingly gives up and, and lays himself down for, uh, so that he can um, give his life for the whole world. That's how he is glorified in his death, and that's when he is glorified. But it's interesting, right? Right, right before we get the world is going after him, and then who wants to see Jesus? A bunch of Greeks, a bunch of non-Jews, people that are God-fearers, yes, but but a bunch of Greeks, a bunch of, of non-Jewish people who are there for the feast. They fear God. They believe in the God of the Old Testament, but they're not Jews, and so they want to see Jesus. Look, the whole world has gone after Jesus, um, and so we already see this coming true, uh, being fulfilled in this next passage uh, in the midst of that there. So I'm going to stop there. Any questions, comments, thoughts? And more theology of the cross. I don't know if that's Nathan or Denise, but you want to just chime in and talk about that for a little bit? No. <laughs> it's all right. Um, you know, yeah. Pastor, I have something. Um, yeah. I yeah, think the ahead. verse has always intrigued me about hating your life here. Whoever hates his life here, or how does that say exactly? Yeah, and I was wondering about that. What is the mindset of a Christian and a believer in that regard, you know? You know, I could say for one, enjoy a pretty good life on this earth, not not without problems, but uh, oh yeah. But um, I wonder what the mindset is to to follow this verse that you hate your life in this world. That's I've always been curious about that. Or yeah, yeah, the, that idea of understanding that if we hold on to our life more than anything else, that if we love our life more than we love God, right? That becomes an idol for us. Um, that becomes something that's there. Um, and when we put other things before God, that's an idol. That's something that uh, draws us away from him. Um, yeah. Having too much hold on the things of the world or having the world have too much hold on us too. I, I like that thought uh, as well. Um, yeah. Joe, you had a comment? Yeah. Uh, Richard, um, I heard this analogy, I forget where I heard it, if it was either one of my daily devotionals or on, on Joy or whatever. Um, compared to eternity in heaven, uh, our life on earth is basically the equivalent of a weekend in an uncomfortable hotel. 
Interesting analogy, Joe. Yeah. And so the idea of, you know, we aren't going to, we don't want to so hold on to the, the, the amenities that it, that has that we miss out on the greater of eternity with Jesus and the new heavens with the new earth. Yeah. It's an interesting analogy that's there. Yeah. And so as, as Christians, um, as, as we think about our life and, and what uh, God has given to us, um, the idea of, um, you know, to not love our life, but we love him. We serve him in everything that we are. If anyone serves me as follow me and where I am, there will be my servant also. If anyone serves me, the father will honor him. Um, and so the idea is that we want to be where Jesus is. We actually, we must be where Jesus is. And there's a, um, a book that's been written called joining Jesus on his mission. Um, and so, um, and, and the idea is so often we want Jesus to bless the work we're doing. Um, but that's getting it backwards. We need to look where Jesus is active and at work and join him there. Where is the need the most? Join Jesus there. How do we see where Jesus is alive and active and working? Not Jesus, come bless the things that I'm doing or the things that our church is doing, but where, God, are you active in our community and how do we join you there? Um, in the midst of our homes, our neighborhoods, our friends, um, in the midst of this time of the coronavirus, where is God at work and active? Um, and I think we all have stories that uh, we have seen on Facebook, on the news, through our church, through other things where we've heard of Jesus showing up uh, and, and working through so many different people. How do we support the work of Christ there? How do we join Jesus wherever he is working and active? That's our call. Um, that's always been our call. But I think in the, this time where we can't go out um, to look even more for where Jesus is. And for some of us, um, Jesus is working in the lives of our kids uh, to strengthen them and to show them that they're not alone. Um, so for kids of that are school age, that means that we're, getting down right next to them, helping them learn and grow. For our kids who are adults and are trying to navigate this new world, that means we're walking alongside them and we're uh, giving them Christian counsel and influence and guidance for, for how God is still at work and active. That's one of the places where Jesus is uh, that we can join him. But it's also in, in so many other places too. So any thoughts, questions, comments uh, in the midst of that? Uh, some of those things I was talking about? All right. Well, so this uh, week, as we journey to the cross uh, through the upper room, through uh, Calvary, uh, through the the tomb and the the empty tomb, uh, we do so knowing that Jesus journeyed to all of that for us uh, to to make us free, to suffer that, to be glorified, so that we could be with Him forever. Uh, and he is alive and active and well for us today. Um, and so uh, we need to join him today and, and this week on his mission, wherever that might be in our lives. So let's uh, go ahead and close with prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for the blessings that you pour out upon us, for giving us your word to strengthen us, for entering into Jerusalem, for entering into our hearts, for being our Messiah and King, the one who brings peace, uh, not just to a city or a region, but to the entire world, peace through God, through the cleansing of our sin. We thank you that he was glorified on the cross. And, and Lord, as we see Jesus uh, in our everyday lives working, uh, not necessarily in the most glamorous places or ways, but just uh, in the everyday lives of your people, Lord, help us to join Jesus there, uh, to serve our neighbor with uh, gladness and boldness. We ask this in the name of Jesus, the one who protects us and keeps us safe. In his name we pray. Amen. All right, everybody, have a great uh, rest of your week. God's blessings to you. Uh, again, check out uh, uh, the things, the resources online. If you have any needs or know of any needs, we're here for you. Um, so whatever we can do to help, uh, God's blessings.